okay. Is your God completely really good? And ever since, okay. So I want to find, does What's God, your background? Uh, in religion wise. I'm Christian. I'm not, sorry, my family's Christian, but I'm atheist. Uh -huh. I don't really believe in it. And the third question is, um, did, your, did everything in the universe originate from your God? So he created everything. Okay. So I wanted to ask, if everything originates from God, and your God is solely good, doesn't that also mean that he created sin as well? Which means your God is not necessarily solely good, and it contradicts the fact that he's not good, and your God is both good and bad, and essentially a grey being. Yeah, so what you're, what you're presenting is the problem of evil. Yeah. Right, so... Here's what you need to understand, okay? The problem of evil, thusly put, which was put like this by Epicurus, actually. That if you have an, om it's not omniscience, by the way, it was omnipotence. So it says if, if you have an om omnipotent God and an all good God, then either the fact that God, is, that evil in the world is not, is, uh, it contradicts either of his two properties, either omniscience, uh, sorry, om omnipotence or, um, or goodness. And this is, uh, has been even debunked now by atheists. Uh, this is uh, the form of the argument like this, has been debunked by atheists. Like William Rowe, who's a, f a philosopher of religion, he debunks it. He says this, this is an intellectually bankrupt argument. The reason why it's an intellectually bankrupt, there's many reasons why it's an intellectually bankrupt argument. The, the, the fact, first of all, one word if you want to put it that way, wisdom. We don't believe in God with two attributes. So it's a reductionist understanding of God, that God is all good and all powerful. We, we believe God is all good, all powerful, all wise as well. And so if you have wisdom, wisdom is uh, basically in, in Islamic terms, it's described as putting some, it's appropriacy. So appropriacy doesn't mean that everything must be good. That's a condition that would only apply if God is only good. But God is good, is, 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 is just and is wise, which means that Sometimes bad things can be good for you. He's forbearing, so he, he acknowledges and sees bad and doesn't... Exactly. So, so that's another one, helm in Arabic, which is forbearing. So there's more that we believe in more than those attributes. Anyway, one could say, that's one line of argumentation, to say that this is a reductionist understanding of God's attributes and one that fails, uh, even according to like philosophers of religion like William Rowe and others who are atheists. But another way of putting it, of the position, is that did God create evil? What is evil in the first place? And for you to answer this question, you have to have what you call a theodicy of some sort. So depending on what theodicy you subscribe to, then you will have a different answer. For example, August, so, so theodicy is your theory of evil in, in relation to God and the problem of evil and stuff. So for instance, Augustine and Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn Qayyim, they, they basically understood evil, these are Islamic and Christian theologians, they, they understood evil as what you call Adamiyya or the idea of uh, privation, which is something, a lacking of something, a, de a, def a depreciation of something. In fact, they say that evil doesn't exist in the real world. There is no evil, that's what Ibn Taymiyyah believes. This is what uh, pure evil, al-shar al al-mahd, does not exist in the real world. This is the, so on this perspective, what is then? How do you describe children in poverty? How do you describe that? They would describe it in the negative term. Child in poverty, or poverty is the lacking of the property of having money, for example. So it's lacking rather than affirmation. It's, so that's one thing. So if we take that theodicy on board, then we will reply to the atheist with it and say, well, how do you prove the existence of evil in the first place? Because you see the point, the atheist has as much impotence and being able to prove the existence of evil as a real objective uh, matter or thing to be... But you're preaching subjectivity, but religion at its basis is objective because there's good and bad because heaven exists. Bad people go to hell, good people go to heaven. So, I mean, again, and if God is solely good in the sense of He helps people, He loves us, He cares for us, that can't really be true because he is the creator of all the bad things that happen. Yeah, but, so once again, to return to my previous answer, you know, the Quran states, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ That you might hate something, but it's good for you. So bad things can be good for you sometimes. And how can it be good for you? For a wisdom that's known to God. The Quran states, وَلَقَدْ بَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيَّئَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجَعُونَ 
we have tested them with good things and bad things so that they may turn back to us. You know, uh, He created the life and death so, he, so as to test you which of you are best in deeds. What kind of test would it be if there's no difficulty? Um, yeah, so let's, I think what's more, possibly more fruitful at this stage mm. You said you were an atheist. For us to start. Well, I, I want to say I, I want to say atheist. I believe in like an entity, but I'd rather, huh? A Kwame, a Kwame. But I'd rather call it the universe as opposed to like you know, because the thing the thing with religion for me is the object uh, the objectivity aspect of it. Because I believe like paradoxically speaking, everything exists within a state of pending pending. So you know, people are pending good and bad because you know, with it, human beings have potential action. yeah potential action. Human beings are potentially you know, they can produce any action they really want to, given time, you know, to do it. So, you know, you can't really objectively standpoint say, you know, humans are objectively good, objectively bad, because any human can be turned to do evil things. Uh, so basically what I was going to say was that you said something interesting. You said that you believe that the universe, would you, let me ask you in fact, do you believe that the universe is uh, the explanation for why everything exists, including itself. Well, the thing is, here's, here's the thing I always tell people, I'm not omniscient. No omniscient being exists that we can factually say, look at and point at and go, he's omniscient, he can give us the answer. Right. So therefore, we can never really know. That's really aside the point in terms of omniscience or lack thereof. Um, I'm asking about, is the universe dependent or independent? Well, I don't. I, I, I can't really answer that question because, you know, I have no perspective to actually right. to, to start it, to answer. Okay. Well, here's, here's what I'll say to you, right? I'll put my, my point in one yeah. sentence. There cannot be mm -hmm. a series of dependent things, mm -hmm. whether that series is infinite or finite. Mm -hmm. That cannot explicate why anything is in existence. That's an impossibility. That brings about logical absurdities, mm -hmm. which means that what must explicate the preponderance of the universe must be something which is independent and necessary. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, let's put it this way, everything that is composed is dependent. Mm -hmm. The universe is composed of parts, mm -hmm. therefore the universe is dependent. Mm -hmm. Why is it dependent? It's dependent upon those very parts mm -hmm. that it's composed of. By definition, by the way. Mm -hmm. By definition. Mm -hmm. This thing here, Look at this, yeah? Yeah. We use it to, you know, praise God and everything. Yeah. There are 33 beads on this thing, mm -hmm. yeah? Now, if we call this, what should we call this? We call this series A, yeah? Now, this series A with 33 beads, it depends on the 33 beads in order to be series A, yeah? Mm -hmm. If I take these beads off, it no longer is series A. Because series A is defined, it's definable by the beads. Okay, but that's limited like, to your like, perspective like, and your... Like your... the universe is definable by its, its, its parts. Mm -hmm. The Earth, the solar system, the system, the galaxy and whatever. What we're saying is that anything which is made up of parts like this is dependent by mm. definition because it's dependent on its parts. And if it's dependent, it requires something outside of itself in order to bring it into being and in order for it to depend on for example one more thing let me just give yeah. you two or three examples right my phone here okay i got a phone yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't be bothered take it out and stuff you know yeah. it, it depends on what your phone depends on what the process the process of the screen the touch right but what do you have to do every day or two with your phone you have to charge, charge it, it right? yeah right so without charging it, it dies, right? Mm -hmm. But that charge that you put your phone in depends on something else. Yeah. Some power plant that's generating it. Yeah. And that power plant depends on something else. Yeah. And it'll go back to the sun. And yeah. that sun depends on something else. Yeah. And it'll go back to the, so, the, 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 the universe and its constants and all these kind of things. The laws of nature. Yeah. And, and so on. Yeah. And I'm saying that if you keep going back in that manner, yeah. even if you don't go back antecedently like in that way, but if you, if you keep asking the same question, what does it depend upon? Then you have to, you have to end off with 
an unterminatable terminator. Yeah. An unterminatable terminator, which in this case we believe is the independent that brings about everything else dependent into being. Let me tell you something else. So that's one example. Another example is, well, have you ever been to the sea? You've seen the sea, yeah? Yeah. If you go to the sea, you've never seen the sea floor. You, you look at the sea and you realize that the water, because of its nature, its scientific nature, yeah, it, it needs to be situated somewhere. The, and the placeholder for this water is the floor, the sea floor. You've never seen the sea floor, and I've never seen the sea floor, but we assume and infer its existence because without the foundation, which is the sea floor, all of this water couldn't be situated anywhere. What I'm saying is the sea floor in this reality is actually dependent on something else, which is the geological landscape, the tectonic place, whatever it may be, yeah? But reality itself must have an independent thing which everything else is situated and every, everything else stands upon. And if it doesn't have that, it's inexplicable. It's unintelligible. There's no way of, there is no way that it's impossible, I'm making the claim, without a necessary existence through which everything else must depend upon and it depends upon nothing. I'm making the claim that absurdities would occur. That without such necessary existence, there are absurdities. That's, that is the claim I'm making. And, and so, because if you think about necessity, necessity is the opposite of impossibility. Okay. But here's the thing. Okay, so now you're applying objectivity into your belief system. Because before you were applying subjectivity because we were talking about good and evil and stuff like that. But now you're applying objectivity. But now I need to ask, but why are you so certain about the dependency of different things? Because, I mean, just because you say this is how it is, one, two, three, four, five, it keeps going on, doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean it is that way. Because again, you're not omniscient, you do not know. Despite, the, as you said with the seafloor, that's a great example, right? We, you can look at the sea and assume a seafloor is there, but you will never actually know until you go. And you might actually go into the sea and realize, oh shit, there's no sea floor. And what would you do at that point when there is no sea floor? No, but that's, that's it's an analogy. I'm giving you an analogy that we are familiar with, right? Yeah. Okay, let me, let me give, that's what you call a cosmological analogy, that, that which has reference to the universe. Mm -hmm. But I can just as much give you a mathematical analogy, mm -hmm. which works from a priori reasoning. So let me give you an example, right? I'm going to give it to you as a syllogism, okay? Any mathematical set, now let me make it clearer. Any non-empty mathematical set depends upon its members in order to exist. Set A, let's call it, for the sake of argument, infinite. Therefore, set A depends upon its members in order to exist. What I'm saying is, this exact thing that I'm talking about can be reasoned on a priori mathematical ground in as much the same way as it can be reasoned in a cosmological sense. In other words, I can give you examples in the world like the, I just gave you right now, examples of the ocean and so on. But I can also give you examples in mathematics. Now, if one has to, in order to disprove what I'm saying here, one has to show how it's explicable or otherwise conceivable that you can have a non-empty mathematical set that does not depend on its members in order to exist. But I mean, I can't remember the book, but there are a few people who have proven that mathematics in itself makes no sense because relativism, the, the philosophy of relativism yeah. completely and utterly just no, destroys no. everything. I, I know what you're referring to. The, the, the person who is most famous for making this postulation was a man, man called Kurt Godel, okay? And he had two theorems called incompleteness theories, which he referred to. But you'll be surprised to know he was, he was actually talking about set theory, in fact, as well. But Kurt Gödel made an ontological argument for God's existence. And the ontological argument that he made is not dissimilar from the one that I'm making right now. So the same man you're using as an authority mm -hmm. is the same man who's, who agrees with me, really, mm -hmm. on what I am saying. 
Just like Leibniz agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Just like Aristotle agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Just like Avicenna agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Just like Aquinas agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Now who disagrees? There are only a few people in history mm -hmm. worth their intellectual worth. Mm -hmm. With intellectual worth that come mm -hmm. in, the, in the Enlightenment period. Mm -hmm. Like Immanuel Kant, who said existence is not a predicate. Or David Hume, who denied necessity, necessity and causation. Or uh, Bertrand Russell, famously, who argued for composition, fallacy of composition. Of, he's, not, he's, he's not a professional philosopher. And maybe I didn't make myself very clear. I'm not arguing against the existence of God. Again, I, like I've always said, like I said from the beginning, I'm not omniscient. So far as I'm concerned, anything could freaking exists. That tree could be a lion for all I know, because again, I'm not omniscient. I cannot objectively state things as fact. But you keep saying you're not omniscient, <coughs> as if that's an argument. Listen, you're not omniscient, but you are making claims. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. You're, you're saying, you're, you're continuously making claims. You don't need to be omniscient to make truth claims. No, but you need, a, you need to be omniscient to objectively, well, paradoxically speaking, from a societal standpoint, which we always use, me and you use to justify things, from a societal standpoint, you need to be omniscient to objectify things. No, you don't. You do. Well, well, 2 plus 2 equals 4, is that true or false? From a societal standpoint, that is true. It's because society, society demands and needs objectivity Look. to work. You the same way religion needs objectivity to, to work. To know the truth of some things. You do not need to know everything to know the truth of some things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. okay, so this idea that I'm not omniscient, I'm not omniscient, is uh, agnostics run away from discussion all the time by claiming ignorance. Agnostics, I'm not saying you are one, they might as well just change their name to ignorant ones. <laughs> No, no, that's what it is. Because an agnostic doesn't know. All right, so if you don't know, what, does, what, 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 what word do we use for that in English? It's ignorant. Mm. We, we're sorry to say, you can call yourselves ignoramuses. You know, dumb, the dumb ones. Mm. <laughs> you know, whatever, like, these are not pejorative terms. They're actually synonyms for agnostic. It's uncomfortable for some people to know that they're dumb or to the, ignorant. But just because they're ignorant on something, it doesn't mean everyone else has to be ignorant just like them. Mm. We. Uh, you know, I'm ignorant of many things. Uh, special relativity doesn't mm. mean uh, just because I'm ignorant. It doesn't mean it's, it's not true. This is called the fallacy of uh, well. You've got two fallacies here. You, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, I've never made such a claim. I don't care about that. You can come and sit down after if you want to have a discussion. But let me finish with my friend first. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I was saying was simply. No, I didn't make the claim about the universe, the beginning of the universe or lack thereof. I'm not making a Ghazali Dependency, I think that's I'm what he's referring to. Argument. Yeah, so um, the, the, the beginning of the universe or the eternality of it or the eternality of a fabric of space or the infinity of the uh, multiverse, any of that stuff, I, I, I grant it all. Of it. No problem. It still does not solve what I am putting forward. All of that does not solve what I am putting forward. I know something that might do. It's called uh, the no boundary condition. By Stephen Hawking. Yeah, no, it won't do it. That won't do it. He said, like, uh, instead of having this thing where everything's dependent on something else, you can have a universe which is like a, what is that? no boundary condition. Yes, but if there's only two options that one Isn't has. Isn't that a paradox where it's like they exist between two, two points? Well, what, listen, there's only two exhaustive, if in, in, in an elimination yeah. argument, in a reductio argument, in whatever type of argument where. In a this logical disjuncture, you can, you've only got two options. Either the universe is dependent or the universe is independent. There, are, there is absolutely no third option. And what I'm saying is, if you say it's dependent, if you say it's independent, then I say you've already admitted to the independence of something, which is exactly what I was trying to get you to do in the first place. Because if it's independent, that must mean everything relies upon it and it relies upon nothing. It's eternally independent. It's right now. If what I'm saying is the universe can't be independent. Why? Anything that is made up of parts is dependent on those parts by definition in order to, to exist. Like, I'll say this again, these beads, 33 beads. Mm -hmm. Let's call this bead 
A, yeah? Yeah. If it is 32 beats, it no longer is the same thing. It re, re, if it is one beat, it's something else now. It's become something else. In order for this to be what it is, it depends upon its constituent parts. Mm. That's it. The universe has made out of parts. Anything that is made out of parts is dependent. The universe is made out of parts. Therefore, the universe is dependent. Mm. And one can say, well, actually, that might not be the case or whatever it is. I'll, I'll add another thing. That's the case. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that is the case cosmologically and it's the case ontologically as well. It's from a priori grounds. How, how ontologically? Mathematically, yes. Because mm. a set, a mathematical set, what is a set? <clears throat> Uh, a set is, for example, if I say you've got three things in a set, camera one, two, and three. You got you got a set of you can have a set of whatever number you like. You can have you can choose whatever set. Me and you, that's one set. We call it me and you is one set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, set we call it set A, which is me and you in it. Okay, so in order for that set to exist, me and you have to exist first. Mm -hmm. So it presupposes my existence and your existence in order for the set to exist. Now I'm saying that. Anything that presupposes an existence of something else depends on those things and is dependent. It can't be independent. Now, that means there has to be something that's independent and outside of the series in order to explicate the preponderance of everything else. Mm. And for there to be intelligibility, uh, well, how can we intelligibly understand the state of affairs? We can only do so with the existence of the necessary thing. And what, that necessary thing, by definition, is God. We call it God. You, can, you don't have to call it God. You can call it the necessary thing. Now, here's the thing. What have we already established about this necessary thing? That is eternal. Because if it's independent, there's no, there's no point at which it cannot be independent. It cannot be a contingent at some time and independent. It has to be independent always. If it's like that, it also has to be what? Pre-eternal, post-eternal, which means eternal in all directions. It must be non-composite. In other words, it's not made out of parts. We just explained why, yeah? Mm -hmm. It must be, if, if you believe in causation, because some people don't believe in causation, I'm putting an if here. If one believes in causation, which if you don't, by the way, there's absurdities going on, but I, I don't want to keep absurd. Um, but that goes right. into infinite possibility and paradoxical. If nonsense. you have infinite possibilities, it doesn't, you can have it. It's not a problem. Mm. This does not defy what I'm saying right now. Mm -hmm. Causality does, because causality is, I swear, it's one thing happening after another thing. No but worries. you can have retro causality, oh, okay. quantum field and stuff. Something happens before, something happens, it affects the happens coming. People talk about it all the time. I'm not sure if you can have retro causality, but people speak of it. And that's why I'm saying that I'm leaving causality out of the picture for now. Uh, because it's a separate argument. I can argue from causality, but I'm not arguing from causality. I'm just arguing from dependence at the moment. Okay. Uh, what I'm saying is, if you look at that, so it must be that. Now the question is, what about will, choice? How do we prove that God is ch choosing things? Now, the way I answer this is as follows. Anything which is contingent and dependent, it could have been another way. What, what do we mean by it could have been another way? I mean to say that it could have been, if it's, a, if, if it's, if it's uh, way A, it could have been way B. For example, these beads could have been yellow. They could have been green. But 2 plus 2 equals 4 can never be anything but 4. If I put 2 plus 2 together, it can never be 4. And if it's dependent, it must mean that if it's dependent, it's dependent on something else. Okay? Because by definition, if it's dependent on itself, it would be independent. So two things. It could have been another way and it's dependent. Anything that could have been another way and it's dependent, implies that there was an external sorting agent. That this necessary being is deciphering, decision, making a decision, choice. It should be way A rather than way B. Like for example, the person who created these beads decided that it will be brown. He could have or she could have decided it will be yellow. He could have or she could have decided it will be green. But a decision was made on the color of these, be uh, these beads. You could say, well, actually no decision was made. There's so many things in uh, nature, which things are the way they are because of, of uh, something else. But even if that is the case, then you have the regress problem that we talked about. So you have to, you have, to have a terminatable thing. But the universe is one way rather than another. 
Now, someone might be a determinist and say, well, actually, uh, if everything is like that because of an antecedent causal chain, I say, even that's, that's no problem, I agree. But it's, it's determined in conjunction with the determiner, which is the necessary existence. But in abstraction, it cannot be said to be uh, it cannot be said to be necessary because anything necessary can never be out of existence. I there was a time the Quran says that we have created you before you were nothing before that. There was a time I never existed, and there was a time you never existed, which means we can't be necessary by definition because something necessary is eternally necessary, it's eternally independent. Which means that in abstraction. If you take that thing in abstraction, there's no quality within me of necessity. Because if there was a quality of necessity within me, I could never cease to be. There would be no time in which Muhammad Hajab, the learned one, would have been... <laughs> there would have been no time where Muhammad Hajab would have not been in existence. I would have been an eternal soul. Or even not an eternal soul, eternal body and soul. Pre-eternal and post-eternal. Now what I'm saying is that that's not the case, which is indication that I'm contingent, that I am dependent. So this is evidence that there is an independent entity that gave rise and gave rise to everything else in existence. And that everything else in existence depends upon it. And if you don't have that, you can't have anything in existence. You can't have, we would not be having a conversation right now. One question that if you ever have time to think about in your home is just one question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Think about that for a second. How can that even be explicable? The only way it can be explicable is if that there was something else which was always there, which is necessary, it could not be any other way that brought, brought rise to that. No other explanation is possible. I'm not even saying is uh, allowable or is intelligible. I'm saying it's even possible. No, there's no other explanation. Any other explanation fails to answer this question. Why is there something rather than nothing? No other explanation on the earth can answer that. There must be this independent thing which everything depends upon for its existence. And that keeps things running. And that has made choices about the universe. And those choices are demonstrated in the fact that the universe is way A rather than way B. Another question one, one may want to ask is, why is the universe uniform, regular and stable? Three things the universe is. The laws of nature are, they have to be uniform, regular and stable. Or well, some will say black hole or quantum field. These people don't understand anything because regularity, stability and Uniformity are not something discoverable by science. You don't really, you don't like quantum physics, do you? No, it's not that. No. I'm saying quantum physics itself, in order for someone to do quantum physics, they have to assume uniformity, regularity and stability of science. They, it's an assumption of science, it's not something which is discoverable by science. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example, bro. I measure the temperature of boiling water what will it be 100 degrees well, unless I've, i'm misunderstood you know the situation but i don't think the learned one will misunderstand <laughs> 100 degrees okay now imagine if i was a scientist yeah and i thought to myself if i measure water today mm. it'll be 100 degrees yeah. But if I measure it tomorrow, it'll be minus 100 degrees. And if I measure it the day after, it'll be minus 1,000 degrees. And if I measure it the day after, it'll be a billion degrees. The fact that I expect as a scientist for there to be the same results today, yesterday, tomorrow and the day after means I assume that science will operate in the same regular and stable way today as it did yesterday and tomorrow as it did today. Thusly, one may say that stability, regularity, and uniformity are not discoverable by science, but that they are assumptions of science. So when people make the fine-tuning argument and they say, well, there's three options, either it's necessity, chance, or uh, design, I say this is a false thing. 
because it's not that you know you have all these constants, the electromagnetic constant, and you know, and so on, and that there are these three options. I'm saying you have uniformity, stability, and regularity, and that those three things, uniformity, regularity, and stability, you can't even do quantum physics without them, without the assumption of them. So if you assume them before you do quantum physics, the question, from whence did they come from? Why is there regularity, stability, and uniformity of nature? How, how is it explicable that there is uniformity, st stability, and regularity of nature? There's only really two options. Option one, that they're explicable by a preponder of some sorts, an uncaused cause, an independent one, th the necessary existence, or that they are self uh, explicable, meaning that they're necessary themselves. Hmm. But the category of facts is not the category of existence, is pre uh, sorry, the category of fact, which in this case these are necessary facts about the universe, presupposes the category of existence. You can't have 2 plus 2 equals 4 as a fact before being existing in some conceptual, universal, whatever realm. Thusly, one may also say you cannot have regularity, stability, and uniformity of nature unless you have some existence that explicates that particular reality. I say that's the necessary existence, which without which nothing can be explained. So we can explain the necessary existence explains everything. It doesn't explain some things. In fact, the, the thesis, the correct thesis of the necessary existence explains everything. It explains why there is something rather than nothing. It explains why there is regularity, stability, and uniform, uniformity of nature. It explains why, why the, the universe is not ceasing to exist right now. Why it's perpetually existing. Because it's dependent upon something else which is in perpetuality existing. And thus, I might say, the atheistic option is impossible. An atheist must be ignorant. Hmm. Either he is deceiving himself or he is ignorant. There's no third option. Hmm. The, the other option may be that he's compoundedly ignorant, so much so that he doesn't know that he's ignorant. That he's convinced himself that he's speaking truth. What? Tell me what explanation the atheist has for why there is something rather than nothing. Um, okay, so most of the time, as you said before, but you don't necessarily like the argument, is relativism. That's the main argument for, you know, because again, relativism kind of cuts through everything. It kind of cuts through logic, it cuts through objectivity, it cuts through any real sense because it opposes it completely. But again, I'm not disagreeing with you. I mean, look at the world we live in, you know, two plus two, as you said, it equals four, it won't equal anything else. But relativism is the main argument well, that what they relativism use. What are you talking about? Uh, pure relativism. In the sense of, um, so I know there's moral relativism, and most people use that. But I mean relativism in its purest form, in the sense of there are no rules, no up and down. Everything applies. Essentially, a paradox in itself. Everything is this independent. Again, my argument about the human beings, about infinite potential, of them being both infinitely good and infinitely bad. Get me the biggest moral relativist, cultural relativist, skeptic in the world. And let me ask him one question, or you can ask him or her this question yourself. Mm -hmm. Or make this statement and tell me if they disagree with it. There is no doubt that there is existence. Can anyone refute the statement? Okay, but I mean, relativism would just argue what is the definition of existence and what the hell is existence. Being. Okay, but what is being? You, say, you say you are being, Something. right? Okay, but then they would ask, what is something? Again, definitions is the problem. There is no doubt there is something. Okay, but you have to define something. The fact, and there something, no, you, the so thing, no, but you're we, taking an objective aspect existence. of something, but the thing is, relativists would say something is subjective, and then something can become anything. I don't know of a single relativist in the literature yeah. worth his philosophical stock, merit, yeah. Yeah. that would embarrass themselves yeah. enough to refute this thing. You know why? Because the, the statement, there's no doubt that there's existence, is irrefutable. Anyone who tries to refute it will presuppose existence. Because you cannot argue against the existence of existence without having being in existence. Hence why I say it's a paradox, and hence why I say I am not omniscient and that I do not, do not know anything. Have, you cannot have paradoxes or contradictions without existence. 
again, but this is why I'm, this is why I say an atheist would argue relativism. No, 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 they wouldn't, because they would be making a fool out of themselves if they say life is a contradiction, life is a paradox. But they would though, because you no, said God. Say it, but a paradox okay. is something. It's, it's, it's meaningless. This is both something. It's time. It's just in the pending between the two. Hence why it's a paradox. If it's something that cannot come into existence, mm -hmm. then it's an impossibility, like a square circle. Yeah, I know, but that's why I'm saying atheists would argue relativism so because you have circle. because you have so given you have given a just argument for why God exists. Therefore, for an atheist to argue God doesn't exist, he has to use relativism because, objectively how can speaking, an, how can an atheist argue with me? If they want to throw logic out the window, what you what tools will you use? If you're saying life is a paradox and that impossibilities are possible, how can you now argue with me when you when he, you have basically said we are not going to be using logic? It's like saying this: a child goes into his math class with a teacher and says, "I don't accept any of the mathematical <laughs> formulas you're talking about." Mm. Okay, and then. He starts arguing, no, Pythagoras should be this way. Mm -hmm. Or, in fact, tri the trigonometry should be done that way. Mm -hmm. You can't make any argument after you've nullified your tools. For it. It's like shooting without a gun. Mm -hmm. It's like you're telling me this. The atheist will shoot you in the head mm -hmm. without a gun. I say, it's impossible for the atheist to shoot me in the head without a gun. Because the, there, if there's no gun, he can't shoot me. Likewise, if he gets rid of his own weaponry, in this case, which is the rules of logic, and, uh, and so on. He can't do anything to me. If you if you don't have logic, you have nothing. You can't make any arguments. Mm. But you argue they would though, because again, you've given a just argument, an objective argument of why God exists. Okay, so therefore, I want you... you to tell me what's wrong with the argument. No, I don't. I, I don't. Again, I don't really. The so argument why works. Would you, okay, do you accept the argument? I accept the argument. Good. Forget about what the. Atheist but at the same time, I don't, Let because me... again, it's so it's you... weird. Okay. Look. Because my original question was, was if God exists... Can I be a bit straightforward and tell you yeah. something? We're ethnic minorities. Uh -huh. Me and you are ethnic minorities. Yeah? Um, atheists will say things. Mm. Usually, they'll say things from the West. Richard mm. Dawkins, this person, that person. They can say all kinds of things. Now, what the atheist says is irrelevant. If what they are saying does not have any analytic or demonstrative proof, we, I'm not saying we have this, but because we're ethnic minorities, we think maybe these atheists have something, they're clever people, maybe they're saying something clever. <coughs> I'm telling you that it doesn't matter. We shouldn't think just because these are white men wearing lab coats or because they're, you know, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, let them say what they want. Mm. You know, honestly, they can say whatever they want. If they can't prove it, they can embarrass themselves for all we care. You know, they, their arguments have not even kept up with the pace of the philosophical inquiry. Mm. Richard Dawkins has been humiliated by Michael Roos, another atheist, who's a philosopher. He, he calls him like a schoolboy. He says he's a schoolboy. He says, going around saying, who created God? He said, this is embarrassing the atheists. Michael Roos has said that. So, it doesn't matter what the atheists say, because most of them, they will just say things to try and avoid the incontrovertible fact. It's an incontrovertible fact. Which is that in order for there to be anything in existence, there has to be a necessary existence. There cannot be a world where in which there's only possible existences or dependent things, depending upon dependent things ad infinitum. That's impossible. That's inexplicable. And so I say, let's put aside what these atheists say. Let's now be sincere about this. Do we really believe? Let's go straight to basics. Could something come from nothing? Well, again, this is this is where the whole causality argument comes into play because arguably you can argue because certain things happen in a certain way. Again, as you said, stability of the universe always happens in that way. No, but if we are to believe there is an infinite potential for causality, then you could also arguably argue then yes, may, it might happen at a very low statistical probability but it might actually happen, that so something comes from nothing. So tell me how, because so you say it might happen. Give me a scenario where something can come out of nothing, where it's conceivable. The Big Bang, most people say the Big Bang comes the, the, from nothing. The, the Big Bang is not nothing though, is it? I don't know if everyone says that. No, everyone says Before it's it comes from nothing though, because it just no, happens, no, it just no, appeared. No, no physics textbook in the world will say this. Oh, yeah. 
know, uh, when they say something can happen out of nothing, yeah. like you, Azar. Yeah. Uh, let's say, for example, if I tell you the dialysis machine, yeah. you know, it's a huge machine, yeah. right? and the fraction it does, yeah. only very small things, like for kidney, yeah. which is about the size, the size of fava beef. Yeah. The fava beef, yeah, yeah, like it's full. We have it. And also, it looks like physically, it looks like fava beef. Yeah. The whole fraction of the whole dialysis is made by the whole machine. Mm -hmm. So, if I tell you that, the dialysis machine come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. and I go to the hospital and say, it's like a spontaneous generation like that. Mm -hmm. Will people think I'm the same person? Mm -hmm. So, why? The same fraction done by the little thing, kidney. Mm. They play ethics or whatever. Think it's coming out of nothing without any. No, but let, 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 let's forget this. Let's just go straight to basics. If it's conceivable that something can come from nothing, surely there should be some kind of demonstration where that could be the case. Mm. What, is there any demonstration you can think of, whether it's cosmological, mathematical, or otherwise, where you can show me how zero plus zero can equal anything other than zero? Mm. No, but right, you can, so nothing can come from nothing. Yeah, but then you can just argue maybe someone hasn't lived long enough to eventually see that, or maybe it's a good we haven't searched far to, to see that within the universe, because obviously we're yeah, trapped within a very spatial bubble. Is, listen, mm -hmm. two plus two equals four. Yeah. It equaled that before I was born, before you were born, yeah. and we'll continue equaling that a million years from now. Yeah. If we lived for eternity, it would still be the same thing. Yeah. Now, zero plus zero is the same thing. It will always equal zero. It's never, it's never yeah, changed. but see, things. This base, this argument, eventually comes down to objectivity versus subjectivity, and with that, there is no, you know, satisfactory answer. It just loops because the idiot will always be like, subjectivity, anything can be anything, yada yada yada, and again, society who favors objectivity and logic will always argue two plus two equals four. And it just continues in a loop and as a paradox and it never really gets anywhere. There's no really satisfactory what, answer. What you're saying to me with, with But I do agree with what you say. I do I do take the objective answer. I'm just playing the devil's advocate okay, of the subjective. Well, we don't need to play the devil's advocate. Mm. Because let me tell you something, right? If you read the greatest minds from the time of Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, all the way through the Enlightenment, all the way through the Renaissance, mm -hmm. Descartes, Leibniz you know, in the Western tradition, in the Eastern tradition, in the medieval tradition, in the Christian tradition, the Jewish Maimonides, Aquinas, Duns Scotus, and so on. Mm -hmm. This argument that something comes from nothing is not made. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, there must be a reason why people don't make this argument. This fool, Krauss, Lawrence Krauss, who wrote a book, Something From Nothing, himself, when he was, when he was confronted about it, he said, look, you know, what is nothing is the quantum field, the black holes are. So with that, nothing is the absence of something. He, he doesn't mean that. He doesn't mean that in his book. So if because he doesn't mean that, he was even rejected by his own atheist friends. Mm. If there was stock in the idea that something could come from nothing, it would be more vehemently made by professional philosophers and analytic thinkers throughout the ages. There is no stock in it. It's mathematically impossible. It's cosmologically impossible. And it is ontologically impossible. Something from nothing, nothing comes. Nothing can come from nothing. The universe couldn't have come from nothing. And the universe could not have created itself. Mm -hmm. Because it would have to exist and not exist at the same time. But this is why atheists say, who created gods? No, that's what I'm saying. If we keep saying that, who created the creator, who created the creator, then we're going to have an infinite regress mm -hmm. of some sorts. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have an in, not, not just an infinite regress of dependent things or causal things, but you're going to have an infinite regress and even if you say, oh, infinity can exist in the real world, the series of infinite regress itself is dependent because it's composed of parts. So it has to have something outside of it which is independent and explicative. In this case, it's a necessary existence. There's no... It's, the, the conclusion is inescapable, actually. Trust me. Well, think about it. Mm. Okay, think about it. I don't want to pressure you anymore. Just think about our discussions. Two questions I want to think about. Why is there something rather than nothing? What is the best reason or what is the best explanation for why there's something wrong with that? But then you have to define okay, no no sorry. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Alright, so uh what a day man. Thanks yeah. so much brother.
no you problem. Need anything, let me know. Yeah. Right. We'll be here and if not, we'll go to Ali and Ali can get in contact and stuff. But it's a pleasure. Yeah. pleasure. You're a very clever person, you know, you're very analytic, you're very critical, but I want you to think about what we talked about. You know, you've been going to the gym, right? Yeah. <laughs>